Our final speaker today will be uh, Brian Lennon, who is uh, Associate Professor of English and Comparative Literature at uh, Penn State University. And the title of the talk is, Can Multilingualism Be Simulated? Okay, uh, while I, <laughs> uh, as I hope will be clear, uh, <laughs> while what I have to say today has any number of points of contact with the two papers that you just heard, uh, I think it would also be useful for you to think of it as complementary to uh, the presentation by our colleague Ruhini Srihari this morning insofar as I'm going to be filling in some, not all, but some of the intellectual and institutional history of the kind of work uh, that Rohini was talking about this morning. Uh, today I'm going to talk about a kind of multilingualism that, while of course deeply social in itself, is quite different from the uh, socially individuated uh, and mostly existential multilingualism whose literary expressions or more often frustrations I wrote about in a book published in 2010 entitled In Babel's Shadow, Multilingual Literature's Monolingual States. The multilingualism that I'm going to talk about today is the product not of the complexity of human social life as such, uh, but of interesting breakdowns in the use of computers to attempt to manage that complexity, uh, and particularly the complexity of linguistic confusion. So what you're looking at on the left-hand screen is the result of an experimental mechanical translation from German into English of a scholarly book review uh, of a, a book on a topic in mathematics. And this text appeared in an essay by Victor Ingve included in a volume entitled Machine Translation of Languages, published in 1955, and containing revised versions of papers presented at the first international conference on machine translation convened at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in 1952. Now, for those of you who are unfamiliar with what I find to be an absolutely fascinating episode in the early history of computing, uh, it's useful, I think, to think of machine translation as the first imagined cultural rather than strictly military application of the arithmetic computing machines developed by the United States and the UK for use in cryptanalysis and ballistics calculations during the Second World War. Much of what we now call computational linguistics and artificial intelligence has its origin in early work on machine translation. And we might say that in many ways, much of that early work was driven by the profoundly cultural power of speculation in the imagination of fully automated, fully computerized, natural language processing and production sufficiently accurate to pass the so-called Turing test by persuasively simulating the discourse of a human being in a particular national graphilect or standardized written dialect. Now, plainly the process that produced this text on the left-hand screen has no hope of doing that. But in the period 1949 to 1966, especially in the United States and the UK, both enthusiasts and skeptics described fully, automatic, fully automated, high-quality machine translation in positively mythic terms as a holy grail. Uh, this is a phrase that was frequently used in the literature of the period. Uh, and what we're talking about here is uh, 
uh, entirely computerized translation of sufficient quality in both correctness by various measures and style so as to require no human preparation of the source text serving as input uh, and no human editing of the target output once the process was complete. Uh, and this dream, and it really is a dream even today, had its own acronym in the literature of the period, FAHQT, Fully Automated High Quality Translation. Uh, and in the rest of this paper, I'll also be using a common abbreviation for machine translation, which is just MT. Uh, now, there's a great deal that I'm going to have to skip over here in order to return to Victor Ingve and the text you have uh, before you on the left-hand screen. And what I'm eliding begins with a patent granted in the Soviet Union in 1933 and then continues in the post-war writings of Warren Weaver in his role as a director at the Rockefeller Foundation in the United States. Around 1946, Weaver began publicly speculating about new applications for the Colossus code-breaking computers built for the government code and cipher school in Bletchley, near London, uh, and suggesting that cryptanalytic techniques might be used or might be applied to the translation of natural languages. Initially, the medium for this speculation was uh, simply private correspondence with figures like the cyberneticist Norbert Wiener, to whom Weaver wrote in 1947, and these are his words from the letter, when I look at an article in Russian, I say, this is really written in English, but it has been coded in some strange symbols. I will now proceed to decode. A memorandum entitled Translation that Weaver distributed to his circle of acquaintances in 1949 revisited this correspondence, referring to Claude Shannon's information theory as well as the sinologist Erwin Reifler's work on comparative semantics in English and Chinese. It also foregrounded a war anecdote, this is Weaver's phrase, related to Weaver by William Prager, a mathematician at Brown University. The German-born Prager, who had emigrated to Turkey during the war before arriving in the United States, had encoded a sentence in Turkish, this is the anecdote Weaver's telling, had encoded a sentence in Turkish for one of his colleagues in mathematics to practice a deciphering technique on. The most important point about the fact that this experiment succeeded, Weaver asserted in his memo, was that the decoding was done by someone who did not know Turkish and did not know that the message was in Turkish. So uh, Prager, who knows some Turkish, writes a message in, in Turkish and then uses some sort of an enciphering technique. The details are not given. Uh, in order to encode the message. Then he gives it to a colleague of his uh, practicing a, a, a deciphering technique. Uh, the colleague succeeds in deciphering the message, but is then crestfallen because it makes no sense. Brings it back to Prager, uh, saying uh, it, this didn't work. Prager looks at it and says, when you uh, break the uh, uh, text back up into words, uh, and correct for the uh, transliteration he used for some letters, uh, the message was in Turkish. Okay? So the first conclusion that Weaver drew from this was that a logical basis for all languages might be accessed using cryptanalytic techniques. Uh, and this conclusion was very quickly discredited. Uh, nevertheless, and this is why I describe much of this work as being driven by uh, the profoundly cultural power of speculation. Nevertheless, Weaver's memo was galvanizing, and by the end of 1949, research groups had been formed at MIT, UCLA, and the University of Washington, where a team was led by Reifler, the most prominent of a very few MT researchers whose training was in a discipline other than mathematics and engineering. Starting in 1950, Reifler, who appears to have been the first to respond in writing to Weaver's memo, circulated a series of papers entitled Studies in Mechanical Translation, using his credentials as a scholar of comparative semantics, a translator, and a teacher of Chinese and German as foreign languages to advocate for MT from a humanist perspective. 
the essay by Victor Ingve that included the text uh, on the left-hand screen was entitled Syntax and the Problem of Multiple Meaning. And it's a good example, I think, of work that balanced speculative optimism with pragmatism and a sense of humor about or in dealing with obstacles. Uh, for various reasons, including real hardware limitations, much of the earliest work on MT had focused on crude word-by-word -word dictionary translation. And Ingva's essay is in some ways an attempt to mediate conflict between the theoretical and perfectionist MIT approach, which was devoted to the long-term goal of FAHQT, and the empirical and operational approach of Reifler's group at the University of Washington, which merely sought to produce usable translations. Ingve began by observing what he called the remarkable fact, these are his words, the remarkable fact that most of the languages of interest for mechanical translation divide a section of discourse, such as a sentence, into about as many words as English does. Furthermore, he continued, and these are his words still, words of various languages can be found that have substantially the same meaning as certain English words. For this reason, he suggests, word-for-word -word translations are surprisingly good, tantalizingly good, and we might as well take them as an acceptable first step. Noting, however, that any given input word may have several meanings in the output language, Ingve admitted that polysemy, especially conspicuous to the translator, is an issue in nearly every spoken or written utterance insofar as meaning in natural language is profoundly dependent on context. This, he explained, had led him to think of context as a kind of repository for, and these are his words, information necessary for the resolution of the multiple meaning problem to be extracted from that repository. Hypothesizing that the sentence was the proper unit of analysis since it is likely to contain enough information to resolve most of the multiple meaning problems, he described an experiment in the partial translation of a book review in German into English conducted manually using index cards to build up a dictionary of German-English word equivalents. Rather than concealing the grammatical meaning of the German original with an imperfect translation, Ingve explained, this partial translation left German word order and grammatical particles, including inflectional word endings, intact in the output. Ingve observed that, and these are his words, people who knew a little German grammar after they had recovered from their mirth demonstrated that they were able to understand quite well and fairly rapidly what was being said while those who knew no German at all were able to grasp only the subject matter from the translated stems and not much else. This, he concluded, suggested that a viable solution to the translation of grammatical meaning is needed. Meanwhile, because, as he put it, and these are his words, slight knowledge of the input language helps the reader a great deal, it was desirable for those who would need to read MT output to obtain basic knowledge of the source language through a brief introductory course. Uh, now this is important because it points to the issue of language acquisition, which I would say formed a kind of absent presence uh, in MT research until it was brought front and center by a report that would produce the nearly complete collapse of research funding in the field after 1966. And this is something to which I'll return at the very end of my talk. So in my book, In Babel's Shadow, I juxtapose this text that you've been looking at on the left-hand screen with a passage from a novel entitled Between by Christine Brookrose. Uh, this is on the right-hand screen. Uh, and I know that this is a novel that some of you in the audience are familiar with. Uh, one of the things I found myself doing in that book was uh, speculating myself about what is similar and what is different about these two texts beyond what's merely obvious about the difference, right? Uh, the text given by Ingve on the left-hand screen 
uh, is, we could say, a prototype of the kind of incompletely translated output that an ordinary civilian, at least, will sometimes obtain from even the best freely available, non-specialized machine translation engines today. Although, of course, it's, it's no longer going to be anywhere near this crude. As such, we might want to say that the text given by Ingve on the left-hand screen marks a gap between the algorithmic computational processing and the human uses of language, and that it thus represents a kind of simulated multilingualism. And I'm using the word simulated both in the ordinary sense and also a bit mischievously uh, in order to turn the tables on the operational multilingualism of much work in natural language processing, uh, the way that it often presumes a certain national monolingualism. And of course, uh, one uh, bit of the work that uh, Rohini Srihari was showing us this morning, of course, contradicts that and represents uh, an advance beyond that. The text by Christine Brookrose on the right-hand screen uh, is, by contrast, an artifact of literary expression. Uh, specifically, the literary expre expression of, say, a multilingual human self uh, possessing the privilege of a certain level of education. These two texts are entirely different in most ways in terms of uh, both provenance and purpose. Right? Uh, one, the text given by Ingve on the left-hand screen is a representation of a kind of failure in relation to the real goals of the work that produced it while Christine Brookrose's text represents what many literary critics and scholars might want to call a virtuosic literary style. But uh, I think that in the monolingual context that they both address, that both texts address, we can say that both texts serve as incitements to multilingualism, or at least to language acquisition, even if both options are very narrowly circumscribed indeed. Uh, and there's a whole host of other issues here that I'm simply not addressing in this paper and which have to do with the history of the European empires uh, and of philology and Orientalism, which all bear on the topic of machine translation, but not uh, in a way that I have time to address today. Uh, so I think that in the monolingual context that they both address, both of these texts serve as incitements to multilingualism or at least to language acquisition, uh, however narrowly circumscribed uh, we may want to see those options as. Uh, and this is why I emphasized Ingve's conclusion, apropos this text on the left-hand screen, that those who need to read machine translation output should obtain basic knowledge of the source language through, as he put it, a base, uh, brief introductory course. Uh, and for that matter, uh, if you can read the text on the right-hand screen in its entirety, uh, you know, you can also choose to read Christine Brookrose's narrator here as invested in the translational dynamic equivalence or commensurability of languages here, uh, just as much as in their difference. Right? Uh, she says at one point, three quarters of the way for the uh, three quarters of the way through that text, as if languages loved each other behind their own facades, despite alles was man denkt darüber davon dazu. So the, these texts are complementary in that sense as well, or symmetrical. Uh, in his memo entitled Translation, Warren Weaver had placed MT in the service of an imperial internationalist ideal, describing the multiplicity of human languages as a worldwide translation problem, his phrase, that impedes cultural interchange between the peoples of the earth and is a serious deterrent to international understanding, also his words. Speculating about invariable properties, statistically common to all languages, Weaver invoked the philologist and orientalist Max Müller, and, apparently unaware of Müller's contempt for them, onomatopoetic echoic bow-wow theories of the origin of human language, suggesting that all human beings had identical vocal organs producing similar ranges of sounds, and these are Weaver's words, with minor exceptions, such as the glottal click of the African native. Phonological and graphic correlations between words in Chinese and English had been demonstrated by Erwin Reifler, Weaver, Weaver noted, while Hans Reichenbach, 
a founder of the Berlin Circle, who had, uh, these are Weaver's words, who had also spent some time in Istanbul, and like many of the German scholars who went there, was perplexed and irritated by the Turkish language, had discovered common features of the basic logical structures of otherwise very different languages. Describing the deep use of language invariance as the most promising approach of all to MT, Weaver imagined languages as towers erected on a common foundation with an open basement and translation as a traversal of that basement rather than shouting from tower to tower. Um, and in another very well-known short text produced during this same period entitled The New Tower, uh, Weaver described computer engineers as building a new tower of anti-Babel. The years from 1949 to 1960 were in many ways a golden age for MT in the United States, defined by such liberal technocratic optimism and by a series of disciplinary advances, if not necessarily advances in technical implementation. During this period, the journal Mechanical Translation was founded to support a growing mass of important publications and a public demonstration of Russian to English MT in 1954 at IBM's Technical Computing Bureau in New York would help secure easy access to generous government, military, and private funding even before the Sputnik crisis of 1957. Although this 1954 demonstration showcasing the work of the MT group at Georgetown University has recently been called contrived and a fraud, at the time it clearly marked a surge forward. Now, these words contrived and fraud appear in a recent memoir by Anthony Ettinger, uh, who began working on MT as a Harvard undergraduate in 1949 uh, and went on to produce the first doctoral dissertation on MT in 1954, uh, and then went on to lead Harvard's MT group for some time afterward. And in this recent memoir, Ettinger recalls that when he joined the Automatic Language Processing Advisory Committee of the National Academy of Sciences, convened in 1964 to assess progress on MT, and these are his words, I knew that I was probably going to end up by taking my own research field down the drain, but I already had the firm conviction that MT was not going anywhere and that it made no sense to perpetuate a fraudulent belief that something might be achieved. Ettinger describes a culture of casinoized grantsmanship with both US and Soviet researchers engaged in, uh, these are Ettinger's words, a kind of amiable conspiracy to extract money from their respective governments, playing each other off with various experiments and demonstrations that sometimes bordered on fraud. The committee's report, issued in 1966, was deeply skeptical of researchers' claims that MT was needed to help process Russian language technical literature, observing that the present supply of human translators greatly exceeds the demand, and that, these are uh, a direct quotation from the report, there is no emergency in the field of translation. It stated flatly that to date, to date, without recourse to human translation or editing, there has been no machine translation of general scientific text, and none is an immediate prospect. And it observed that after eight years of work, the Georgetown group could still not produce output usable without human post-editing. Finally, it noted that in some cases, these are the words from the report, in some cases it might be simpler and more economical for heavy users of Russian translations to learn to read the documents in the original language adding that many US scientists already did just that, that instructional resources were available for those to inclined to make use of them, and that acquiring basic reading facility in Russian was not likely to divert disablingly large quantities of a researcher's time. Apropos the labor cost of using human translators to post-edit MT output, it quoted Robert T. Beyer, a physicist at Brown University, who observed that, these are Beyer's words, I found that I spent at least as much time in editing as if I had carried out the entire translation from the start. Even at that, 
I doubt if the edited translation reads as smoothly as one which I would have started from scratch. I drew the conclusion that the machine today translates from a foreign language to a form of broken English, somewhat, somewhat comparable to pidgin English. But it then remains for the reader to learn this patois in order to understand what the Russian actually wrote. Learning Russian would not be much more difficult. Uh, now, this uh, is as far as I have time to go today uh, with this passage that I would say juxtaposes the simulated multilingualism of failed machine translation with the acquired multilingualism that it would seem to encourage. Uh, two final notes in conclusion. Uh, the first is that the ALPAC committee's report, the, the impact of this report was really in many ways nothing less than devastating. Uh, by 1968, the Association for Machine Translation and Computational Linguistics had dropped machine translation from its name. Uh, as the 10 US research groups that were active in 1963 dwindled to three, with research virtually shut down in the UK and also significantly reduced in other contexts in which it had been growing, like uh, Japan and the Soviet Union. Uh, the second thing is that, as some of you know, uh, this is not the end of the story by any means, because new work on machine translation tied to much more modest goals eventually emerged after 1975 and 1976 under the sponsorship of the European communities. Uh, and thus, the so-called winter of machine translation was really a relatively brief one. Uh, but I think that we can say that it took the ALPAC report and this nearly complete collapse of both public credibility and research funding to get machine translation researchers to move beyond what I would call the metaphysical objective of fully automated high quality translation uh, and to resign itself to a durable human computer symbiosis. Uh, it's been pointed out that it was only after the ALPAC report in subsequent work on interactive human computer translation workstations that professional translators were invited to join MT research efforts as translators uh, rather than as models for their computer surrogates or post editors of their output. Thank you. <laughs>